Hey everybody, Liam Clisham here for another awesome Redshift tutorial. Today we're going to look at how to properly hook up a Megascans texture or a Polygon texture or an RDD texture and where all those texture maps plug into in Redshift. So let's go ahead and jump into it. <laughs> All right, so inside of Cinema 4D, I've got a really simple scene setup. I've got this dome light with an HDRI, I've got a plane here, and I've got this Redshift tag on that. So I'm gonna be using some textures from Megascan. You can really do this with whatever you want, either from Polygon, Megascans, uh, RD textures, wherever you're getting your textures from. Some of the language might be a little bit different. So if I go in to this Megascans bridge app and double click on this stone that I wanna use, You'll see Albedo here. That's actually diffused depending on where you download it from. Depending on where you download from too, you may get a gloss map instead of a roughness map, or you might get a specular map. Um, some of these things, depending if you're using Unity or Unreal, matter. But inside Redshift, um, they, they don't really matter except for gloss and roughness. Those things, I'll show you how to switch those out. And then Albedo is just diffuse. So the five things that we're gonna need are albedo for diffuse, AO for ambient occlusion, displacement, and our normal map and roughness. And we'll just grab, grab these and drag them in. You know what, I wasn't, I didn't create a material first. Create a material first, let's call this stone. Let's try this one more time, go into our shader graph and we'll drag these in one more time, just like that. All right, so I'm gonna spread these out in accordance with how I'm gonna hook them up. So, I've got albedo, diffuse, which I'm probably just gonna call diffuse from now on, ambient occlusion, roughness, normal, and displacement. So let's hook up our diffuse into our diffuse color. And I'm gonna run through this a little bit more advanced thinking that you know where these things line up in the hierarchy here. And I'm just gonna tell you where these texture maps and uh, color maps and things like that are supposed to be plugged in. So uh, diffuse goes into diffuse, roughness is going to go into reflection and roughness here. So a lot of it kind of correlates one to one. And before we continue, I wanna make sure we have our texture on here so you can see what's going on. So pull this back off, you'll see it's all glossy, hook it back up. We've now got a nice kind of rocky roughness going on. So for our normal texture, we're not gonna be using the normal map node. That's actually being phased out and they've updated it that you can now plug in normals into the bump map, just like bump. So you can use either one. So for this, since normals use X, Y, and Z coordinates and are more accurate, we're gonna use our normal map, but you can plug a bump map in here too, a black and white one. So we'll go like this, go to texture, input, and hook it up to our overall bump. I'll spread this out a little bit. And so when I look at this, I expect something to happen. And the reason it's not happening is you need to make sure your input type is actually set to tangent space. Again, using X, Y, and Z coordinates, the red, green, and blue that you see inside a normal map here. It makes like these purple um, 80s colors. And now you'll see we get some like faux displacement and some shadowing in here. And if I adjust the height, let's say like five, you'll see it adds even more depth to it. I think one for now should be okay. But there's something else that you need to be aware of that I wasn't aware of until I started reading this awesome discussion on the forums. And if we come back in here, you actually wanna do a gamma override and make sure you're working with a linear workflow. So you can see it makes a big difference. If I turn that off, we get some displacement, but if I turn it back on, you'll see even in these areas here, we start to pick up this displacement. And I'm gonna override this up to about five again and to really show you. So let's turn that off. So we get some displacement, not so much over here in these little details, but as soon as I turn it on, you can start to see these fine details coming out. And I never knew about that. I always thought that it just automatically knew to go to a linear workflow. So if you've been having problems with normals and displacement, make sure you're using a linear workflow here. So now 
this is looking a lot better, and we haven't even added any displacement in yet. So for our displacement, we need a displacement node. And I'm going to hook this up here, go to texture, texture map. And before I continue and actually hook it up to the output, I want to show you the redshift tag here. So normally it comes with this turned off under geometry. You want to make sure you turn this on. And under here, you want to turn on your tessellation and your displacement. And now when we hook this up, you'll see we get a little bit of displacement, but nothing spectacular. So just a little bit of change there. We need to make sure this is linear as well. Again, a little bit of change. And so what I've been doing and I didn't realize was wrong either is I thought you scaled everything in here. So if I scale that up, you'll see it gets displaced a little bit, scale it up again, starting to add some detail. I'd go up to like 500. Like, man, Redshift just doesn't really know how to handle displacement maps as well as I would expect. Oh, well, I guess I'll deal with it. I, I mean, I like the program throughout, so maybe it will just be something they update in the future. Nope, I was just unaware that I was doing it wrong. So let's bring this back down to one. So what's happening is the maximum displacement that Redshift is being told to allow through is a scale of one. And then in here, there's also a displacement scale. So you can kind of fine tune in your node over here, but over here you can set an overall displacement scale. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna set this up to about 20. And you can see we just got a little bit of depth added into it. And then if I set this displacement scale to 20 as well, now we're really starting to get some stone show up. So if I go over top here, do like a nice little top down view, I think if I bring up this lighting a little bit more, that should help. Now it actually feels like we're getting some stone displacement in here. And then if I turn on a quick bucket render, you can see it's nice and clean. And like I said, you can fine tune in here. So if I want to do like 0.5, lower it down a little bit, make it a little bit more even. If I go to the side to show the displacement, you'll see that. I think. Doing one here and then really adjusting the overall displacement really helps. So why don't we try something like 35 and 25, get a little bit more displacement in there. And so now we've really got these this like stone walkway kind of look. And so what else we can do for getting even more detail is adding in this ambient inclusion. So there's been a few ways that I've been told to do it. And one of them was to get a compositing tag and hook the diffuse and the AO into it and set the, comp the compositing tag to multiply. Other people have said to plug in the AO into your overall color. And I found mixed results with that. And someone on the forum, again, just pointed out that you can just throw it into your texture adjustment and color multiplier. So as soon as we do that, you see we start getting these really nice ambient inclusion shadows. And if you want to play with it, um, I'm going to just see if having a linear workflow really makes a difference here. It kind of does. It lightens it up a little bit. I think we can just leave that off for now. But if you want to add in some adjustments, you can grab a quick ramp. And let's go ahead and pipe these into each other. I'm going to turn off the bucket rendering. And let's darken up these shadows a bit, add some more contrast. Make sure you're on Alt 2. That way it really comes through. It's only going to read a UV map if you don't have it on Alt. And now you can see these dark areas really darken up. And I can bring up the highlights too a little bit. Really bring out some detail and finesse that. Um, and get some really good looking depth and displacement that I think I'm not alone in this and have been doing wrong. Um, so that's it. It's really pretty much five textures and then making sure you're using linear workflows in your normal and displacements and then coming into your redshift tag and setting your displacement up. Now I said in the beginning too that sometimes you might be given a glossiness map. So let's take a look at that really quickly. Let's get rid of this roughness and you'll see it will get super shiny and kind of like we're watching Moana. We'll just come in here and gravel. 
So let's say we got this gloss map. We'll hook that up here. And we'll plug it into the same spot. And it's just got to process the texture for a second. It hasn't been hooked up before. There we go. And you'll see it pretty much looks the same, right? Like, let's hit refresh. It's kind of not doing anything. And that's because Redshift is set up to read a roughness map, but it knows that, you know, depending on your workflow, you may actually need a glossiness map converted. So if you come into your advanced tab here, so click on Redshift Material, Advance, Convert Glossiness to Roughness, and we can just do it like that. And now it gets a lot closer to the roughness map we had before. So if you're working in a Unity workflow or Unreal workflow, and you're working with artists that are outputting glossiness maps, this is all you have to do. You can still work with them and be in the same pipeline, and you just convert this over. So this is it hooked up, but not converted, and then converted to roughness. You can see we get that same detailing that we were getting with the roughness map. All right, everybody, that's it for this week's tutorial. Thank you so much for joining in. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave a comment below. It's really awesome to interact with you guys and answer questions or try and figure things out. With that said, if you have any questions, every Thursday night we do Redshift Live, and you can come hang out either on Twitch or YouTube or various other channels and do a live interaction of, hey, how do I solve this in Redshift? see what I'm working on in Redshift, try and dissect things in Redshift, just whatever you want to do. It's just a live session. I've got the chat going and I try and just make some cool stuff and solve problems that maybe we're all facing. All right. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Again, thank you so much and I will talk to you soon. Prograph.com, an online resource for learning Cinema 4D, After Effects, and other motion graphics tools specifically catered to help you prevail as a motion graphic designer. What's up, bros? Welcome to another Prograph motion graphics tutorial. With tutorials, plugins, and now a podcast with tens of thousands of listeners worldwide. Yeah, it's a great community to be part of. We give you professional time-saving tips, industry news, interviews, shortcuts, and lessons that help keep you current in the world of motion design. Throw in HDR Studio, take the render settings, pick the HDR, put a reflection, and gorgeous. I love projects that scare me. When our art director comes to us and asks for something that I had never done before, man, it gets me pumped. Our weekly long-form podcast will give you the latest news, help you in your file management, hardware configuration, and client relations. Learn about the latest render engines, modeling techniques, and workflow integration while staying entertained. Real nice banana. <laughs> That's so funny. All right. I'm going to live forever. <laughs> Our BroGraph talks are a chance to see the way industry leaders from around the globe are changing the face of motion design. Sometimes you got to make stuff that you're not going to put on your reel. And I'm not here to judge. The podcast and talks include people like People, Barton Damer, Nick Campbell, Andrew Kramer, David Ariev, Chad Ashley, Paul Babb, EJ Hassenfrost, Mitch Myers, Chris Schmidt, Jules Urbach, Cornelius Dammer, David Brodeur, Andy Needham, Caitlin Kaju, Zubair Parker, Noseman, Ryan Bean, Casey Hupke, Nick Lyons, Sage, Joey Corinman, Jeremy Cox, Rick Barrett, John Dickinson, Matthias Omatola, Patrick Gosky, Brandon Clements, Steve Teeple, Tom Glimpse, Patrick Longstrom, Julia Simone, Devin Coe, Al Heck, and even Dead Mouse. You get that render done. Yeah, you better frame frame what? Our BroGraph breakdowns go behind the projects and give you an insight on what it's like to manage and maintain your own personal business or work for a large company. Join us for live sessions, check out our useful plugins, watch time-lapse projects, interact with us, and send us email questions and topic ideas. Or just hit the rando render button and do an imaginative daily that'll keep you on your toes. Take all your dreams and let's do it! Subscribe today and get automatic updates on the latest tutorials, tricks, tips, and inspiration brought to you by industry professionals Dave Koss and Matt Milstead. We don't care how you get here, folks. Just get here. Subscribe now to BroGraph Tutorials.
pretty good, I guess. 